Hello and welcome to the webinar on Optimizing the Benefits of Hairy Vetch in Organic Production by John Teasdale of the USDA ARS Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ad professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many recorded webinars on organic to farming topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speaker. John Teasdale is a re retired plant pathologist from the USDA ARS Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab. He currently conducts research as a biological sciences collaborator with the same unit. His research has spanned many topics in sustainable, agricultural, in, in sustainable agriculture, including integrated weed management, cover crop management, and cover, cropping system performance in long-term experiments. Yeah, as I've uh, prepared this, this uh, webinar, um, I've discovered really how much work has been done over the past three decades, both by researchers and uh, farmers, learning to use hairy vetch and cropping systems. Um, as as um, such, I've, I've found that there really will be only time in this talk to touch briefly on several um, of these topics, uh, which does provide the opportunity then for several follow-up webinars that could be developed based on uh, some of these topics in the future. Um, I'm going to organize the uh, talk around some questions that might be asked about how to use uh, hairy vetch uh, as a cover crop. So I'm going to start with the question, should I use hairy vetch as a cover crop? Um, there we go. Um, whenever we use a cover crop, we, we sh should have a very specific objective for why we're using the cover crop. Um, I've listed six possible um, objectives that we might have that we commonly um, might have for using cover crops here that, that range from preventing erosion, sequestering carbon, recycling nutrients, fixing nitrogen, reducing weed uh, pest populations, and basically reducing the overall uh, radiation exchange with the soil. Um, now, vetch can um, influence and certainly uh, make a contribution in all of these cases, but I would submit that the reason that we really um, would want to use hairy vetch is its ability to fix nitrogen. I think this is the one thing that vetch is very good at and is probably the main reason why in an organic system we would want to use um, a vetch cover crop. Most of the other other objectives, there's other crops, other cover crops that may do it better, but vetch is one of the best um, options we have for fixing nitrogen. Um, so I just want to review some of the attributes of hairy vetch. Uh, it's a winter annual legume. It produces abundant biomass um, with a high nitrogen content, generally um, on the order of 120 to 160 pounds per acre of nitrogen. It's got a low carbon nitrogen ratio, which means that it decomposes fairly readily and will release that nitrogen. So it really is best to, to use in a, in a rotation before high nitrogen requiring crops. Um, it also establishes easily. It uh, is uh, probably the most winter hardy annual legume cover crop. Uh, it's widely adapted to much of the U.S. except um, probably north of zone four. And in the spring it provides uh, very good ground cover. So even if you have some gaps in your stand, usually the, the long vines that vetch produces will uh, fill in and, and give you just about complete ground cover. Um, now one characteristic that has been, been cited by many farmers as a problem is the fact that it has persistent hard seed and many, many feel that uh, vetch can become a weed in their field. Um, I'm showing some data here uh, by Ben Crockett, who's a graduate student at Penn State. 
um, where he buried um, vetch seed, and then after six months, he found essentially a range from three to eight percent uh, viable, and he, these will uh, probably represent the hard seed that then can persist for several years. Now, in this graph, you, um, it's a little hard to notice, but there's a, um, a red bar here that represents scarified seed, and you might wonder where the red bars are. Well, um, in fact, the, uh, all of the scarified seed in this experiment by six months basically had zero uh, seed survive. So uh, I think this is a very um, nice result that, that offers a potential by using scarification may, may be a good way for us to be able uh, to eliminate uh, hard, this hard seed problem. Okay, how should I plant hairy vetch? Um, I think it's probably most important to prepare a good seed bed, a good firm seed bed where we can get good soil seed contact. Um, it's also uh, important to be in a field with good drainage. Uh, one thing that vetch doesn't like is it, it is wet wet uh, soil conditions, especially if if um, uh, you have standing water for any length of time in the field during the winter. Um, if you're planting a vegetable crop and plan to, to plant your succeeding crop on beds, then sometimes it's, it's good to just uh, create those beds in the fall before you plant vetch and get them up off of the, the uh, 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 soil level where, where they can uh, be exposed to standing water. Um, planting methods, drilling is probably the best. Uh, grass forage seeders work well. Uh, broadcasting does not work as, as, as well unless you really have ideal uh, moisture conditions. Uh, you just uh, don't get the, the good soil seed contact that you need to uh, get good emergence and establishment. Uh, seeding rates that are often cited are on the order of 15 to 30 pounds per acre. I'd say for organic production, if you're really relying on vetch as your, your primary source of nitrogen, it probably is best to go with the higher rate just to ensure that you get a good, a good stand. In fact, um, it, it's uh, good to make sure that, that the whole establishment, seedbed, and planting methods um, um, are, are, are done just to ensure a good, a good stand uh, is obtained. Okay, which cultivar should I use? And I use the word cultivar in parentheses here because uh, what geneticists have told me is that, that uh, vetch um, um, more exist in populations, that there isn't the uh, genetic uh, purity that we normally um, associate uh, when we use the term cultivar. There we go. Uh, so what is the, German age, uh, the germplasm diversity of hairy vetch? Um, Jude Mall in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab has done some nice work basically characterizing the genetic relatedness among vetch accessions. Um, he explored the USDA germplasm collection and um, after doing some hierarchical clustering analysis, was able to group uh, batch accessions into, into uh, basically 10 groups. Um, and one trait that, that uh, found that, that seemed to be associated with these groups is uh, flowering. So the, these first five accessions are mainly um, uh, coincide with late flowering types, whereas the um, group six and seven seem to be more associated with the early flowering group. Um, so flowering date is an important trait then that defines uh, um, the genomic variability in hairy vetch. And the interesting thing about flowering is that it seems to be fairly tightly 
um, aligned with both winter hardiness and winter dormancy. And by winter dormancy, I mean the um, uh, ability of vetch in the late fall to uh, basically go into a quiescent state. It often will turn to um, a purple or gray kind of color, and then it comes out of that and will green up later in the, in the uh, as spring approaches. Um, and generally, the late flowering tends to be associated with the more winter hardy types and the more more uh, strong winter dormancy, where early flowering is associated with the less winter hardy types and less uh, winter dormancy. The, these types really remain green and um, uh, into the winter, and that may be one reason that they're less winter hardy as the tissue is more uh, susceptible to freezing. Um, some populations um, of vetch that are available, the late flowering, uh, more winter hardy types, uh, Nebraska common, which is thought to be derived from an earlier uh, cultivar that currently is not really available now called Madison, um, Albert Lee. Um, and I know that there's been uh, considerable work done in the upper Midwest uh, farmer selections uh, that have been made on, on uh, winter hardy types up there. Um, early flowering uh, seemed to be based on, on Auburn germplasm that was developed by George Moschitis at, at Auburn University. Uh, he developed in the 90s AU early cover. Um, Tom Devine, who's shown here on the right, uh, then uh, tried to develop AU early cover types that are a little more winter hardy and has come out with um, uh, populations per purple bounty and purple prosperity. Uh, Steve Groff, a Pennsylvania farmer, has made selections uh, of AU early cover for over 10 years now and um, ha has uh, developed a population that's, that's uh, adapted to southeast, southeastern Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, when should I plant hairy vetch? Um, generally, we want to plant when soil temperature and moisture conditions are what I'll call moderate. Uh, we want to avoid the hot, dry weather of summer, and, uh, and but we don't want to wait so late that we get into cool, wet uh, conditions in late fall. Um, generally, we want to permit sufficient growing degree days to obtain high biomass and nitrogen content before termination in spring. Um, <coughs> and this means that we really want to have a good plan then on how we're going to terminate vetch in the spring and uh, uh, plant our crops. And I want to turn to this question first. Um, so I'm going to talk about two, the two kind of extremes of the spectrum uh, where we would either till under vetch or use a no-till system with either mowing or rolling vetch. And the tillage, we would uh, can basically do this any time, either when the vetch is uh, vegetative or flowering. Uh, we would probably want to use this approach if we want to prepare a seed bed for early spring planted uh, crops. Uh, um, if, if we want to incorporate amendments, facilitate nitrogen release, or facilitate the cultivation of weeds where a clean-tilled soil would allow you to better uh, uproot and desiccate weed seedlings. The no-tillage system would be um, reasons we might want to use this system is to pervert, pre preserve soil organic matter. Uh, some of the mulching benefits from a surface residue, such as reducing soil and nutrient losses, uh, improved rainfall infiltration, lower evaporation, and weed suppression. Now, um, mowing and rolling in an organic system where we uh, mechanically kill vetch can really only be done at, at flowering. Um, if we try to do this at vegetative stage, the, the vetch will tend to just regrow um, and compete with our crops. Um, I do want to mention here that I have uh, shown basically, as I said, the two extremes 
there's been a lot of interesting work done in, in Oregon as well in, uh, as well as New England in strip tillage. So there are a number of hybrid type uh, systems that can be uh, done here, and there just isn't time for me to go into that. But that's that's something that could be the topic. I think a nice topic for a whole other uh, uh, webinar. Okay. Um, another fact in, in planning the timing of, of planting hairy vetch is to know that vetch biomass accumulation is a linear function of the growing degree days. So um, we found that we gain about 265 pounds per acre of biomass for every 100 growing degree days. Um, that's to a base 39 degree Fahrenheit. And so one example of how we might use this, if we want to transplant vegetable crops following a hairy vetch cover crop, and uh, say we want to plow till the hairy vetch, we want to transplant on the 90% frost-free date for our area, um, and we want to grow at least 4,000 pounds of vetch dried biomass per acre. Uh, then we can just simply compute the number of growing degree days that will take, which in this example would be uh, 1,509. And then from that, we can determine the fall planting date. So in this case, I've taken uh, five uh, locations ranging from Binghamton, New York to uh, North Carolina. Um, I've determined the 90% frost-free dates for these locations. And then if we just work back uh, 1,509 growing degree days, this would be the planting dates would essentially range from late August in, in New York to uh, around mid-October in North Carolina. Um, uh, I think the important message I have here is that uh, regardless of what method we might use to uh, determine when uh, uh, to determine when to when to plant, we want to allow sufficient time to gain the biomass and the nitrogen production we're going to be uh, need. Um, again, if vetch is going to be our primary uh, uh, nitrogen source, then I think it's, it's important that we plant uh, sufficiently early that, that we uh, ensure achieving the biomass and nitrogen production that we need. Okay, um, another question is how should I manage crops following hairy vetch? Uh, this is a big question and could take us in many directions. The direction I'm going to take in this talk is, is to talk about two, two systems that I've worked with over the years. One is a uh, tomato growing uh, tomatoes in a no-till vetch uh, cover crop and a second is growing corn in a roll-killed roll uh, roll uh, vetch cover crop. So to begin with the tomato uh, system, basically the system that we developed, uh, we preform beds, plant the vetch on the beds, then mow the, um, the vetch, transplant through the vetch uh, residue, and we end up with a nice uh, field of tomatoes growing with this uh, vetch uh, uh, residue. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleague, uh, Abdul Baki, Dr. Abdul Baki, that I worked on, on uh, this system for many years. And uh, much of the details for this system is in this uh, bulletin that is available on the web at this, this website. There we go. Um, OK, in much of our, our work, we uh, compared hairy vetch with a polyethylene mulch. Um, uh, and one of the problems with the polyethylene mulch is the fact that, that um, you have two-thirds of the soil covered by this impervious surface, which uh, does allow for uh, runoff and, and uh, leaching from fields. Um, Pam Rice and Kathleen Hateman did some nice 
research uh, several years ago where over a three-year period uh, they looked um, in detail at the uh, uh, erosion losses uh, from these fields and they found that 90, in 93% of events that the runoff volume was greater uh, from plastic than from uh, vetch mulch field and in 90% of the events the soil loss was greater from plastic than from vetch mulch uh, field. So there definitely is an environmental benefit to, to maintaining a no-till um, uh, situation with a, with a surface mulch. Now one reason for using um, polyethylene has always been that it warms the the soil in the spring. So I've shown here the hours per day that the soil temperature exceeded 20 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, generally for uh, tomato optimum tomato root function nutrient uptake is between about 20 and 30 degrees centigrade. Um, and black poly generally um, during the first four weeks of the season that we measured this, uh, for 19 out of the 24 hours of the, the day had a soil temperature greater than 20 degrees, whereas in the vetch less than half of the hours, 11 hours per day, the soil temperature exceeded 20 degrees. And the early root length um, uh, reflects this, where we have higher root lengths with black poly than with vetch. And when it comes to early fruit yield, we had about twice the fruit yield compared to vetch. However, by the end of the season, we have a, a higher fruit yield in the vetch system than in the uh, black poly system. And this is fairly typical results that we've seen many times over the years. And um, But I think it's important that uh, the, the point number one I want to make here is that in a no-till uh, vegetable cropping system, um, inhiri vetch uh, requires a sufficiently long season to overcome the early season temperature depression that, that will occur. So if you're in a northern uh, environment where uh, seasons are short and the, the spring temperatures are cool, then the vetch system may not be the, the best system. There really needs to be a, a, a long enough season. Uh, this shows the same thing in a different way. I've shown here the leaf area um, on the vertical axis and time uh, throughout the, from the fourth week of the season to the end of harvest. And we see that around the beginning of harvest at week 10 that the vetch the tomato plants growing in vetch tends to develop a higher leaf area and maintains that throughout the harvest period compared to black poly where the plants tend to senesce during this period. Um, research um, done by um, Dr. Matu and his colleagues in our lab has shown that, that vetch grown tomato plants accumulate gene transcripts that tend to enhance both disease suppression and delay senescence. So there actually is a genetic uh, 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 response that, that is um, triggered in the tomato plants that, that drives this um, uh, delayed senescence that we tend to see. Um, we've tried to determine whether this is purely a nitrogen response or, or whether this is, let me push that again, there we go. Um, we, we've tried to determine whether this is purely a response just to nitrogen, um, ex, extra nitrogen that Betch is providing or whether there's something additional that Betch does. Um, this shows um, the gene expression for two uh, of two genes, nitrase reductase, an important uh, uh, enzyme in nitrogen metabolism. And we see that in the bare soil, there, there was really very little response to uh, nitrogen. And that across all these nitrogen rates, we have a higher um, nitrate reductase activity in the vetch 
plants. Um, osmotin is, is involved in disease resistance, and we see a similar thing, that there is uh, less responsiveness to nitrogen uh, by osmotin in, in bare soil, but in the presence of vetch, then there is a very striking nitrogen response. So essentially, the, this data has told us that qualitatively, the tomato plant seems to be responding differently to vetch than it would be just if, if all vetch was doing was just providing additional nitrogen. Now, this can be, um, system can be visualized then as um, that the live vetch basically when it's killed uh, generates some kind of sig signaling metabolites uh, to the soil that um, then trigger a response in the tomato roots. Uh, we think cytokinins are involved in, in uh, hormone signaling to the uh, plant tissue that then uh, leads to response of longevity, fruit, uh, increased fruit yield, and enhanced disease resistance. Um, and the question we have really is what is the nature of this signal that, that is occurring in the, in the soil? Uh, uh, as I just said, the data previously showed implies that it's not just nitrogen. Um, and one clue to this is some work that, that Jeff Beyer did looking at the soil microbial community structure in the tomato rhizosphere. And it seems to segregate where there's a very distinct um, difference between vetch and uh, tomato plants, tomato plants grown in vetch and tomato plants grown in black holly uh, segregate the opposite uh, sides uh, in this analysis. Vetch seems more associated with gram-negative bacteria, black holly with gram-positive bacteria. So this uh, implies that there's a different microbial community that develops in the vetch system and may, uh, uh, may be involved in mediating the, the uh, signaling response that we're interested. So much more research needs to be done on this um, project. OK, how do I manage nitrogen following a hairy vetch cover crop? We've talked about our, our main reason for using vetch is to provide nitrogen to our crop. Um, a common set of experiments that was done actually back in the 80s and the, the 90s was to uh, look at the, the um, response of, of crops grown um, in cover crops to uh, rates of fertilizer nitrogen. And the standard, th this graph, uh, um, some data uh, from Morris Decker and Andy Clark at the University of Maryland. And there's three, three main points I wanted to show here. Uh, one, of course, is with zero fertilizer nitrogen, we have uh, greater corn yield in the vetch. And this uh, would be expected since the vetch is providing nitrogen. Um, however, the second point is that that um, as we add fertilizer nitrogen, we still do get a get a uh, response. Corn still responds. So vetch by itself does not provide all the nitrogen that that is needed. Um, and the third point is that even at high nitrogen levels, vetch still seems to have a higher yield than where we had no cover crop. Um, and this is frequently seen. And this, this may be explained by the kind of uh, genetic um, responses that we just talked about. And it probably also, uh, this is no-till um, corn, so this also could just be uh, soil moisture conservation by the, the uh, vetch mulch. Um, we've also done some work in tomatoes and seen a very similar type of, of response. Now, this, all of this research is generally done in conventional um, fields. Um, and so one question that I have is, is this applicable to organic uh, farming? 
and I just wanted to review the sources of nitrogen in organic production. Um, we, of course, start with a reservoir of, of soil nitrogen that's already uh, available in, in uh, soil organic matter. Uh, we then have the um, nitrogen that would be derived from legumes in the system, such as vetch. And then we have various uh, additives from animal manures to other types of byproducts that we can add to enhance the nitrogen content of the soil. Now, in conventional systems, this um, soil reservoir is often low, so we add the nitrogen from our legume, but this is not um, enough, so we often then would have to add uh, additional nitrogen in the conventional system would be, be just in the form of fertilizer. Um, in organic systems, however, the whole um, one of the main drivers in of, of developing a good organic soil is to develop a, a high organic matter, high mineralization potential, and so often we have a much greater potential than in a mature organic soil to to meet the nitrogen needs of the crop. So it may be an organic system that we have, that, that in a mature organic soil, we have enough nitrogen uh, plus that of the, the legume to meet the, the requirements of the crop, and we may not need the additional amounts. Um, so the second uh, point I would make here is that vetch alone may not provide sufficient nitrogen for optimum crop yield. Supplemental nitrogen may be required, but I'll, I'll leave a proviso that in a mature organic soil with high mineralization potential, this may not be true. And more, more research is definitely required on this point. OK, uh, this shows some. Um, research that was done by Rich Rosecrans, Greg McCarty, and Dan Shelton on nitrogen release uh, from cover crops and soil cores, that this was a closed system so they could uh, capture all the nitrogen released in solution form and that uh, released in gas form. And uh, um, basically, that that's, that's released in, in uh, solution form is what would be available for crop uptake, but it also is nitrogen that could be um, uh, available for runoff or leaching. And likewise, um, the nitrous oxide that's lost in to denitrification uh, could could um, contribute to greenhouse uh, gas emissions in the system. Now, in this slide, we see that vetch really uh, both produces much higher level of solution uh, nitrogen as well as uh, greenhouse gas emissions than the other treatments. And what's interesting is that a rye plus vetch um, mixture actually seemed to mitigate the, the, these large nitrogen uh, uh, releases. And so this, this may be an important uh, way to mitigate these uh, losses of nitrogen that could be an uh, uh, environmental problem. So the uh, third, third point I would make here then is nitrogen from hairy vetch really needs to be managed with similar care as is required of fertilizer nitrogen management. Uh, we should probably avoid use on soils that would be prone to leaching and uh, vetch grass mixture may mitigate the potential leaching and denitrification losses that can come from vetch. OK, um, in the remaining time I have, I wanted to talk about the roller crimper system. Uh, can organic corn be produced in this kind of a system? Um, there's been much interest in this. Uh, Bill Curran, Stephen Mursky, and Bill Mason gave a, a webinar about a year ago uh, on this whole topic. So I won't try to, to go into a lot of detail here. Um, instead, I want to just uh, uh, focus on results of a recent study um, 
that we've completed at Beltsville. And the bottom line answer that uh, we have is that potentially the roll kill system can provide equivalent or better yields along with the well-known enhanced environmental benefits uh, compared to a tillage-based system. Now, I use the word potentially because I think we're not there yet that we can't um, uh, consistently manage this uh, um, system at the level that we would like to. Um, there are several issues that um, still need to be uh, overcome. Uh, one is the potential for corn stand reduction. Uh, we often, um, I think this is a function of, uh, well, of two, two things. There's a mechanical issue of just placing the, the seed through the heavy uh, residue into the soil, getting good soil seed contact. And another is insects, that we've seen uh, problems with seed, seed, seed corn maggot and the uh, rootworms, um, and they can be devastating. They, they thrive under uh, uh, um, the lush uh, vetch residue, and they can be devastating on corn young corn seedlings that are, are establishing. Um, another problem we've seen is, is inadequate weed suppression by the vetch mulch, um, as well as reduced cultivation efficacy. Um, and I'm going to talk more about these latter two uh, today, because I think this, this seems to be the uh, uh, biggest hurdle, I think, to uh, using this system consistently. <coughs> okay, um, weed suppression by hairy vetch residue is is often inadequate. Um, our research and research by many over the years has shown that we need about 8,000 pounds per acre of residue biomass um, is typically required for good weed suppression. Uh, However, vetch residue really rarely exceeds 5,000 pounds per acre, and also that residue decomposes rapidly. So even if we uh, get more by the middle of the season, often the residue uh, levels have declined considerably from what they were at the beginning of the year. So even though we have good ground cover of, of residue, we often uh, get many seedlings uh, growing through this residue, and of course the same um, nitrogen and moisture uh, benefits that corn gets from uh, a vetch mulch uh, also encourages growth of weeds as well. Uh, one approach to beefing up essentially the, the amount of residue is to uh, mix hairy vetch with small grains. This can increase residue biomass and weed suppression. I've shown here some data um, where we had hairy vetch. We had a vetch plus rye and vetch plus rye plus crimson clover. And we see essentially um, higher residue biomass. Uh, in this case, approaching this 8,000 uh, uh, kilogram per hectare uh, threshold. And um, weed biomass was reduced, and the yield loss uh, to weeds was reduced. OK, another approach we can take is using uh, cultivation um, to try to eliminate weeds that do emerge. Now in this system, we try to disrupt this residue as little as possible. So we, we've uh, been using a sukup um, cultivator system that just involves a blade that runs below, just below the surface of the, of the soil and minimally uh, disrupts this, uh, this mulch. Um, our research, however, has shown that the cultivation efficacy of this is lower than a typical system um, in a clean-tilled field. Uh, in this case, we're comparing uh, disc-killed vetch, where the vetch was incorporated, and we use a rotary hoe and sweep cultivators. 
Uh, generally, we the average over three years, we got about 75% weed control. Um, and this range, the standard deviation range from slightly less than 60% to uh, around a little more than 95%. <coughs> the, in the roll kill system, however, um, with this cultivation, uh, the sukup cultivator, we average only over three years about 51% weed control and much, much higher variability uh, as low as uh, less than 20%. And, uh, but in some cases, we got good weed suppression of greater than 80%. Um, so I think the issue here is often that you can see this cultivator going through a patch of weeds right here. And uh, um, as it passes through, it leaves the weeds still remain attached to a slab of soil above where the cultivator runs. And, and these can then survive. And you don't get the kind of uh, dislodging of weed roots from the soil and the desiccation that you would normally uh, try to get in a, in a clean cultivated situation. <coughs> so uh, given the difficulty in completely suppressing weeds, both with just the surface residue mulch and uh, trying to cultivate, I think it's very important to, to maintain a low weed seed bank in this system. This shows an example of a field where we had a low natural seed bank in. And this was supplemented then with three different rates of, of wheat seed. Um, and at the natural level, um, you can see we had uh, low biomass. Um, and corn yields were, were very similar to that of the weed-free control. Uh, as we supplemented the, the seed bank, however, you see an increase in weed biomass and a corresponding decrease in corn yield so that at the highest uh, seed bank, we actually had greater uh, weed biomass than we had did grain biomass. So to summarize now, and in this case, I'm summarizing um, all of the, the reduced tillage systems I've talked about, both vegetable systems and grain crops. Um, I think for, for these systems to work well, it's important to have an extended growing season where we avoid the cool spring. And we can delay termination until uh, vetch termination until vetch flowering. Um, and this permits the full expression of anti-senescence vetch properties. Um, also, we need ample and evenly distributed rainfall to be sure that, that um, to help uh, decompose and the vetch residue and release nitrogen. Um, we will probably need some kind of supplemental end sources, whether it's from the soil reserves or from other types of amendments. Um, and we need a good weed management plan, so uh, which would involve a, a rotation that maintains a low weed seed bank, uh, eliminates perennial weeds. Uh, we want high residue levels, perhaps by using cover crop mixtures. And we do need a post-plant weed management strategy for dealing with weeds that do emerge. So with that, I'll um, bring, bring my formal remarks to a, to a halt. I thank, thank you for your attention. And um, uh, turn this back to Alice, I think. OK, thank you very much, John. Um, we'll be starting our question and answer um, session right now. And um, for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and then just hit return. If you don't see that question box, um, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question, and it'll open up. Um, I just also wanted to mention um, that this webinar is being recorded. So um, it's going to be posted to the eextension.org website. 
under upcoming and archived webinars. Um, John has kindly provided his contact information here in case you have questions um, that deal with his webinar. Um, but if you have additional questions um, that are more general about organic farming, um, you're also welcome to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. And I'll pull up that link in just a moment. Um, let's see. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll be running more webinars on cover crops as well as on organic fire blight control in orchards. And you can find these upcoming webinars and all of our recordings at the link on your screen. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention that we really value your feedback on these webinars, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So um, I just wanted to start out with the first question here. Um, can you talk more about managing nitrogen release um, just as you would with using um, chemical nitrogen or fertilizer nitrogen? OK. Um, well, my, my understanding, and um, I should say that th this is an area I'm not an expert in. There's probably many others listening that could answer this better than I could. But uh, generally, if you're talking about nitrogen release from um, a vetch cover crop, the, um, it's a function of the carbon-nitrogen ratio, usually. And as I said early in the talk, vetch has a low carbon-nitrogen ratio, um, which means it will decompose fairly uh, fast within uh, really, uh, one to three, four weeks, uh, you can get the majority of the nitrogen will be released from vetch. Um, and that's one, one reason the section that I talked about, the potential environmental uh, hazards, um, we're getting basically a quick release of nitrogen from vetch, uh, similar to what you might uh, do if you did just uh, uh, provide nitrogen in the form of ammonium nitrate. Uh, fertilizer. Um, so I, I think that th th this needs to be managed carefully. Um, when it comes to the um, um, so I um, so I'm not sure what uh, direction this question was going. There is a um, fairly quick release. Um, and this does uh, provide this nitrogen available in the soil solution um, in the same way that fertilizer nitrogen is. Um, this often, um, if you have drier conditions, this might not be released as, as extensively. Um, um, in fact, in a Mediterranean climate like uh, California, I know there they actually incorporate the vetch into the soil because often they don't get the rainfall in the summer to get good release of, of nitrogen. So it is very much of a rainfall dependent process as well. So I think I'll stop there. OK. Um, let's see. Um, here's someone who wants to know whether um, hairy vetch is toxic to chickens. Um, and also someone else wants to know whether it's a good crop for bees. So if you could address those two. OK. Um, the chicken part, I really have no idea. <laughs> I just don't. Uh, so if there's somebody else there that does, I guess they could uh, send a message in to Alice. Um, as far as bees, uh, yes, it is uh, very much um, a good pollinating crop. Actually, you often see bumblebees, I think, are, are probably the best pollinators of vetch. And I know Tom Devine, when he did his breeding program, he actually would um, import bumblebee, um, uh, bumblebees to use in the, uh, for the cross-pollination that he uh, wanted to perform. But yeah, that, that's something that, that's uh, very prevalent. If you see on a nice sunny day when the vetch is flowering, you'll see they'll be covered with uh, bumblebees and other types of bees and insects. OK, we had a comment on the chicken question. Um, the answer, thank you very much, was um, seeds are deadly, but the plants are not poisonous for chickens. But the seeds oh, are. OK. So. Good. OK, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, let's move on here. Um, 
let's see. With regards to the different microbial community data, which you discussed um, mm -hmm. in the article by Bayer in 2010, right. under vetch and black poly, um, how much of that distance reflects temperature and moisture differences in the underlying soil? Yeah, that was actually an interesting part of that study is we, we had thought that, um, um, I know Jeff says that microbial populations are often, um, uh, basically the community structure is driven by uh, temperature and moisture. And so this was one of the um, questions we had. And in this study, we actually designed, um, we had treatments besides black polyethylene, we had white polyethylene with the intent that that would um, not warm the soil as much. Um, and uh, we had other treatments such as rye treatments and, and um, the like uh, in the study, bare, bare soil as well. So we really had, had a range of treatments to try to separate out some of the moisture and uh, temperature differences. Um, for instance, the, the moisture would be expected to be pretty similar between rye and uh, vetch uh, cover crop, although you don't have the nitrogen, you have different nitrogen dynamics in those cover crops. And generally we found that, that, that the uh, temperature and moisture variables did not um, always segregate um, according to the, the uh, mulches. So it wasn't purely uh, temperature and moisture uh, um, situation. But that was definitely one of the, one of the um, points that we wanted to uh, look at closely in that study. But there seemed to be more than just the temperature and moisture involved in that, that uh, segregation. Okay, um, we have a question on um, how low temperatures um, vetch can take and um, what frost does to it and how, you know, what temperatures it can withstand. Yeah, well that depends on the uh, flowering type. I mentioned that, that, that the more winter hardy uh, types are your later, later flowering types. And generally, um, I think the data, I'm, I'm just trying to recall our data, but I, I think you, um, well, uh, uh, snow cover, uh, first of all, is important. So if you have no snow cover, then temperatures, um, down at zero degrees Fahrenheit and below can can uh, cause extensive winter uh, damage. Um, if there's snow cover, of course, that that can uh, protect you. Um, the earlier flowering types, I'd say those. It's the temperature is probably more around ten. I'd say ten degrees Fahrenheit, something on that order. That a single night exposure would, would um, uh, could kill uh, those. So there definitely is a difference uh, there. OK. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we have a question about the cost of vetch um, relative to other legumes, uh, the cost of seed. OK. Um, I don't have that information, actually, uh, the current information on those costs. So, so again, if some, somebody else out there maybe uh, has purchased uh, vetch relative. To some of the other, other legume cover crops that, that you might use uh, um, besides vetch would be crimson clover in the, in the, the south, um, Austrian winter. Peas is another one, so I think those would be um, some that that you would want to make that comparison. But um, I'm thinking something on the order of of uh, of uh, two dollars. Uh, 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 but I'm just not um, sure. Yeah, I could probably look that up yeah. and. Okay. Catalogs there. Um, let's see. How mature um, does the vetch need to be to prevent it from re-sprouting when you mow it? Say that okay. again. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. It yeah, sounds yeah. like we may have lost the sound yeah. for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. How mature does the vetch need to be to prevent it from re-sprouting when you mow it? Ah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, there's been quite a bit of work. Um, I think now the, the uh, feeling is that it should be 75% flowering or greater, um, some, somewhere between 75% flowering and um, pod set, where, where the vetch will often start to uh, set some early, early pods before it completely uh, um, is done flowering. So um, there, there was um, a paper by uh, uh, Mishler uh, from Penn State um, that um, I think it was published in Agronomy Journal around 2010, as I remember, so it's fairly recent, and it, it does a nice job of laying out that uh, uh, relationship. But I think, yeah, that there, there's a fairly small window, because if you get too early, like I said, then it will, will re-grow. Uh, uh, the, the, vine, the vines tend to lay on the uh, surface of the soil, and so often you might have like up to a 10 foot vine and you may have only three or four feet that are um, erect and the rest of it is laying on the surface. So even if you mow or roll that, you don't, you don't often kill those, those uh, vegetative vines that are laying on the soil surface. Um, so, the, so you don't want to be too early, but at the same time, if you wait too late, I think, um, then you can start getting actually seed production, and that would just add to the hard seed problem that can occur with vetch. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a question from a grower who's in um, Lansing, Michigan, and mm -hmm. um, he's had poor germination um, with vetch. He's tried to do um, no-till vetch in late September, um, but without luck. He said um, the following year he plowed, broadcast, spread, disked, and packed the soil in late September, mm -hmm. still with poor germination. So he's wondering whether he should plant earlier or somehow change his seeding methods. Yeah, probably late September is too late, I would say, in Michigan. Um, the Let's see. We've lost your sound. The area. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. now we're back. <laughs> Uh, the area that we're in in Maryland, um, our ideal planning, I'd say, is around mid to late September. So, I, um, in that data I showed for uh, New York State, and most of the people I know that that work in New York, New York State, I know they they like to get their vetch in by late August. So, uh, my guess is that in Michigan that would be a similar uh, situation. Okay, um, let's see, here's another question um, about um, some of the data you showed. Um, the data from 1994 showing vetch equal to 150 pounds per acre nitrogen and no um, cover. Was the soil sandy and with low organic matter or would the differential be less on soils with a different structure? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I believe that that particular experiment was um, done on the eastern shore, that data probably was, which is a sandy soil that would not have a high uh, fertility level, um, uh, would not retain nitrogen as well. The organic matter level is quite, quite low in those, those fields, so they would tend to be very responsive to nitrogen. Um, but yeah, the, the, the soil type and the amount of organic matter and the mineralization potential of the soil is very important. So um, for organic uh, systems, as I mentioned, if you've already developed a, um, um, a good high organic matter, high mineralization uh, um, soil, then it may be that you won't get as big a uh, Response to vetch, and it may be that 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 the vetch may be all you then need to grow a high nitrogen requiring crop in that situation. Whereas if you have a, a low mineralization, low organic matter um, soil, then I think 
that definitely the you'll get a bigger response to vetch, but you may also need additional sources of nitrogen to really optimize yield. Okay, um, let's see, how um, long does it take an early flowering vetch as opposed to a late flowering vetch? Oh, um, um, yeah, the difference is about 14 days generally. The AU early cover tends to usually flower about 14 days earlier um, than the uh, common vetch. Um, and, but that often is an important difference because if you're... Um, uh, want to do um, a no-till system where you uh, would either mow or roll the cover crop. If you have an earlier uh, variety, it just um, makes it that much earlier than that you can plant, plant your crop. So there is an advantage to having these systems, but as I say, right, right now they're fairly tightly linked with the winter hardiness. So um, if you need that winter hardiness, it's probably better to uh, uh, to go with the later uh, varieties. Okay, um, we have several questions about um, what you mentioned about scarification of mm -hmm. the seed. Um, one person wanted to know whether you can buy the seed scarified or um, how can farmers use that information? Can they scarify the seed? Um, you know, how would they how would they make use of that? Yeah, this is new. Um, some new information um, and and so there really hasn't been I think an industry uh, uh, developed yet but I think it is an, an intriguing uh, fact that this uh, and an important uh, finding that this could be a way of dealing with it but no the seed doesn't come uh, scarified at this point um, it may be if there's enough demand there there may be seed, uh, seed people out there that that might offer that for a fee, I would think. But I, I, I would guess that the, at the moment, if farmers wanted to do that, they would need to uh, uh, develop a method to do that themselves. Um, and the uh, folks that have done this research, as I say, are at Penn State. Uh, so Bill Curran would probably be the one to contact um, about that. The graduate student was his uh, student, so I, I'd say Bill would be the best person to contact to get more information about that process. Okay, thank you. Um, someone commented that um, Welter seed has vetch for one dollar and ninety cents per pound. So thank you for that comment. Um, let's oh, see. Um, what type of mower have you used? Oh, okay. Do you want to say something about that? Uh -huh. No, no. No, I was just going to say the two dollar guess I made then <laughs> was not yeah. not not far off. Not far off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, what type of mower have you used? Oh, uh, flail mower generally. We we like to use a mower that um, will essentially drop the residue back in place. The other um, thing that's important about a mower is that it be a high speed process that the that if you try to use something like a sickle bar mower that the vetch vines will tend to just wrap on that uh, wrap around that and the mower will uh, just pull the vetch out of the ground often so you need some kind of a, a of a high speed mower to really be able to cut through the vines without it uh, grabbing and wrapping around the the mower but but the best option is to have have a mower that 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 not only chops the the vetch um, residue into into fragments, but then just drops those in place, so it so it creates a uniform mulch. Okay. Um, there was a question about who you said was working on organic strip tillage of hairy vetch in Oregon. Was mm -hmm. that John Luna? Or? Yeah, mm -hmm. John. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, in the example that you gave of corn after vetch, is there any tillage required for weed management or is it entirely no-till or does the vetch provide weed management in some capacity? Yeah, well I can provide a little more detail there. Um, yeah, I mean the typical way that we, that we might um, 
grow corn following vetch in a tillage-based system would be to plow down the, the vetch and then create a seed, um, a seed bed for the corn. And uh, generally, the approach to controlling weeds then would be to use uh, uh, cultivation uh, equipment. And usually, for that to work well, what you want is a fairly fine, light um, soil, so so you go through with the rotary hoe, and that uh, loosens the soil ideally, and and uh, creates a loose soil environment on the surface that seeds don't germinate well in, um, but your crop seeds are below that, um, and they they have good seed soil contact, and can uh, access moisture and nutrients, etc. Um, and then you come through with sweep cultivators for any weeds that do come up. And again, the idea is to come through when the weeds are fairly small and you dislodge the weed roots from the surrounding soil. And then in the hot sun during the day, they uh, desiccate. Um, so that's the, 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 the standard approach. In the case of the no-till uh, vetch system, we, we do rely on the mulch to suppress some um, weeds, and they do. I mean, we um, have shown that, that at a common biomass of four to 5,000 uh, pounds per acre of vetch residue on the, on the surface, we can get uh, 50, uh, 50 to 70 percent weed suppression from that. Um, but that still leaves a lot of weeds that, that can grow through that residue. Um, and uh, the problem is that then if we want to come through and cultivate those weeds, if we just uh, use the approach that, that we try to maintain that residue on the surface and just run a blade below it, that the blade doesn't have that same um, disruptive influence on, on uh, separating weed roots from soil, but it essentially leaves a, a slab of soil right along the surface of the soil that the weeds, um, small weeds especially, can stay, stay uh, rooted in. So in that, that system, I think the best strategy may be for us to let weeds get a little bigger. And then if we come through and actually cut off the, the, the top of the weed from the, the roots that have grown more extensively, they might have, have a harder time recovering from that. So I, I think the strategies probably need to be um, um, a little different for how we deal with this uh, high, high residue cultivation versus the, the standard approach to cultivation. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, the next question is, um, can you comment on the potential for grazing hairy vetch cover crops with ruminant animals? Um, again, that's a subject I don't know a lot about, okay. so I'll I'll pass on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, can you intercrop vetch with winter wheat as a source of nitrogen for the following season's corn? Oh, um, um, well, I think the um, um, if the the wheat were being used as a cover crop, then I, I would say yes. Um, in fact, that's a standard um, practice that many, many growers use is to uh, mix the vetch with a, a small grain cover crop. So they're, they're both planted at the same time. Uh, uh, rye is another small grain that's often used with, with vetch. But you certainly could use wheat um, as well, but the point would be that the wheat would be a cover crop, so you, you would be growing it with the intent that you're going to destroy the cover crop before you plant your your corn crop in the spring. Um, if the intent is to grow a wheat um, with the intent that you might want to actually harvest the wheat in the spring if you have a good crop, then I think you certainly would not want to grow. Um, uh, you would not want to interseed 
vetch in that because vetch, because of its viny nature, will actually grow up into the, the weed and become a weed uh, itself. Okay, thank you. Um, let's mm -hmm. see. Um, I, here's a question from a grower, because I just don't see any options for doing this management. Either you work the vetch in or you roll it. Um, are there any other choices or other options? Sure. Um, basically, I was giving the, the um, extremes um, of what's possible, but they're, um, yeah, um, the uh, uh, strip tillage, uh, as I mentioned, is 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 one approach that pe people have used, um, uh, especially in more northern areas where you want to be able to warm the soil in the area where your crop is growing. You want to give it a clean uh, uh, seed seed bed, essentially, but you still want to maintain some surface residue to uh, help prevent erosion and provide some of the other. Uh, benefits that you, you can get from uh, minimizing tillage. So, um, and there's probably many approaches one can use in that um, in that realm. Um, I'd say with vegetable production, again, if you go with the bed type of of situation, where you would plant the vetch on on beds, you could maybe come in in the spring and again uh, maybe till just the surface of the bed but maintain re residue in the troughs of the bed. Um, something like that might work well too with a, with a vetch uh, um, small grain mixture. So um, yeah, I think the uh, possibilities are endless really for the various combinations of uh, tillage and no tillage that one can do with with these crops. Okay, um, here's a question about the um, whether the gene transcripts carry over to the next crop to help with disease suppression. Yeah, well, the 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 um, uh, transcriptional. Um, enhancement that we saw in tomatoes um, is the following crop I'm talking about. So, so essentially the vetch is providing some kind of signal and of course one thing we, we thought that probably was is nitrogen but we showed that there's more to it than that but there's some some kind of a signal that vetch is providing but then where we see the gene um, expression um, take place is in the tomato plant itself. So it is in the following crop. Now, um, if the question is, is there um, some some kind of a signaling uh, molecule or, or um, that, that might persist in the soil for multiple years, um, that's something I don't know. Um, OK. Um. Let's see. Um, we have a question about whether an inoculant is needed um, when planting hairy vetch. Uh, yes. If if a vetch has not been planted in that field, then I, I would say definitely there should be uh, vetch is in the the same inoculum group with peas. So so basically, if you if you've grown peas and vetch in a field before, then there should be sufficient in, uh, inoculant, and you wouldn't need that. But if you've not, then then definitely you should use an inoculant. Okay, we have time for one last question. And um, mm -hmm. it was just, um, I think somebody needed a little bit of a conclusion for what you talked mm -hmm. to, about from um, what is the best cover crop for organic sweet corn or mix of cover crops? Um, she missed that part where you were comparing mm -hmm. the different combinations. Oh, okay. Well, there, there's um, the best combination of cover crops is the question? Well, she just said, what's the best cover crop? So um, if you could just okay. for organic sweet corn. For organic sweet corn. Well, yeah. again, um, the nitrogen it is one thing that the, the vetch can provide for you. Um, and then the question becomes, do you go with just a pure vetch cover crop, or do you go with with a mixture of vetch and, and, and rye, say? Um, 
and I, I think that uh, something like sweet corn, to, um, um, the work we've done with sweet corn, um, we've seen that the sweet corn does not necessarily need the full amount of nitrogen that you would say with with grain corn. It's a shorter uh, shorter season, so I think I would tend to go with a mixture there just to try to mitigate some of the the uh, potential nitrogen losses you could get with a with a very high nitrogen uh, batch cover crop. Um, and to say say a word more about the mixture that um, we tend to reduce the rye component of the mixture. If you go with a typical uh, one and a half to two bushels of rye, which is often um, the seeding rate that's used with just a pure rye cover crop, that usually will overwhelm the vet. So we, we find that um, it's better to go with, with a lower rate of, of rye so you get more of a balance um, of of vetch and uh, rye in the mixture, so I I think for sweet corn that would that would tend to be my uh, choice. Okay, well thank you. Um, we're running out of time, but if you didn't get your mm -hmm. question answered, um, John has kindly provided his email address, and if you have a specific question about his um, webinar, he offered to um, let you contact him. And then um, we also have, if you have um, other questions, you can use the online Ask an Expert service at www.extension.org/ask, and you can get an answer there.